we present What O Jeeves by P.G. Woodhouse. Starring Michael Horton as Jeeves, Richard Bryars as Bertie Worcester, and James Villas as Esmond Haddock. season, episode four, The Village Concert. Of all the frightful aspects of life at Deverell Hall, the Hampshire residence of Esmond Haddock and his five aunts, just about the foulest was that Gussie think Nottle and I had exchanged roles, self having checked in as Gussie, and Gussie answering to the name of Worcester. As a result, we lived in constant fear that at any moment my Aunt Agatha or Gussie's fiance Madeline Bassett would arrive, tear off our whiskers and denounce us. And indeed, the day prior to the King's Deverell Village concert had been almost entirely taken up with various schemes and ruses to prevent just such a disaster. In order to get Aunt Agatha to postpone the proposed visit to Deverell, Jeeves had persuaded my cousin Thomas to run away from school without leaving a forwarding address and come to stay at the vicarage with Corky Purbright. Meanwhile, Corky's brother, Catsmeat, and I had separately hot-footed it up to Wimbledon Common to allay the suspicions of the Bassett, who had threatened to blow in to see what Gussie was up to. And as Catsmeat had shot off from there in my car without waiting for me, it was not until fairly late on the Thursday morning that I at last got back to Deverell, feeling as I tottered off the train as if I'd been glued to the carriage seat since early boyhood. The first person I saw buying motion picture magazines at the bookstall was my repulsive, carroty-haired cousin, Thomas. Oh, hello, young Foss. You've got here all right. Oh, you look like something the cat brought in. So would you if you'd been travelling half a night on a milk train. No, I wouldn't. Yes, you would, you supercilious little squirt, swanking about the places if you bought it. Out of my way. Ow! That hurt! Good. Hello, Corky. Hang on. Where did you spring from, moon of my delight? Did you see what was in the station? I did. Jeeves delivered him as per memo last night. Yes, he told me. Poor Uncle Sidney wasn't too happy, I'm afraid. But I think it's good for a clergyman to have these trials, don't you? It makes him more spiritual and consequently hotter at his job. I love him anyway. What a sympathetic, sweet-natured boy he is, Bertie. You... You were speaking of my cousin Thomas. Yes, he's so loyal. When I told him Constable Dobbs had arrested Sam Golwin for biting him in the leg, he simply boiled with generous indignation and promised to think up some means of retaliation. What? Yes. Wasn't that angelic of him? By the way, have you seen Catsmeat? Eh? Uh, not to speak to, no. Why? I met him just now and he was singing like a linnet all over the place. He had a note from Gertrude Winkworth this morning... And she says that if and when she can elude her mother's eye, she will elope with him. His cup of joy is full. I'm glad someone's is. Percy, my lamb, what's the matter? What have you been doing to yourself? What have you been doing to yourself? You look like... Something the cat brought in. I was going to say something excavated from Tutankhamun's tomb. What's been happening? Corky, I've been through hell. Oh? And how were they all? I've just come back from Wimbledon. From Wimbledon? Meat was attending to the Wimbledon end. He told me he'd been down to head Madeleine Bassett off. He succeeded, by the way. Oh, he did? Well, that, I suppose, is something. Yes, but what did you go to Wimbledon for? Me? I went to Wimbledon, young C. Purbright, in order to intercept and destroy a letter Gussie wrote to the Bassett yesterday telling her their engagement was off because his heart now belonged to you. What? Yes. Gussie's heart belongs to me? Yes. What do you expect, you infernal young pipsqueak, when for the last five days you've been making this think nottle the plaything of an idle hour? The superheated newt fancy is completely non compass about you. Look at the way he frisks and bleats around. Why do you encourage him? Are you trying to activate the green-eyed monster in Esmond Haddock? No. Well, that's what it barely looks like. But whatever the reason, Corky, it's got to stop. I've explained to you what will happen if the think nottle Bassett romance gets sand in the gears to such an extent that it ceases to tick over. Bertram Wooster will be faced with a fate that is worse than death. Biz, 
marriage. You must cool Gussie off right away. Every second he spends out of the frigid air is fraught with peril. You want me to return him to circulation? Exactly. Switch off the fascination. Release him from my clutches. That is right. Certainly. I'll attend to it as soon as convenient. Well, why not in stand up? Well, I'll tell you, Bertie. There's a little job I want him to do for me first. Job? What job? Corky! Ah, here's Thomas at last. I've decided what to do to that cop who arrested your dog. I'm going to curse him. What? Curse him. Wham! Back! Whoop! My God, you can't do that. Why not? Yes, why not, Bertie? People do it to people in detective stories the whole time. All you need is a small but serviceable rubber bludgeon. Uh, have you got one, Thomas? Yes! I bought one in Seven Dials last holidays. I was going to use it on Stinker of a lower fourth, but Dobbs is going to get it now. Oh, that is sweet of you, Thomas. And you're quite right. It will do Dobbs all the good in the world to be coshed. It may prove a turning point in his life. But, but, Bertie, be quiet. Come on now, Thomas. Hop in. It's time to go. All right. Here, my poor man. Don't spend it on drink. Ow! Corky. Yes? What job? I beg your pardon? What job do you want Gussie to do for you? Oh, it wouldn't interest you, Bertie. Just a trivial little job about the place. Cheerio. See you at the concert tonight. Corky. Cheerio, Bertie. As I hoofed along the road that led to Deverell Hall, speculating dully as to what precisely Corky had meant by the expression, trivial little job, something large and Norfolk jacketed hove into sight, and I identified it as my host, Esmond Haddock. Owing to the fact that, on the instructions of Dame Daphne Winkworth, port was no longer served after dinner, I had not enjoyed a tete-a-tete -tete with Esmond since the night of my arrival, when he had confided to me that Corky was still the lodestar of his life. I'd seen him around the place, of course, but always in the company of a brace of assorted aunts or that of his cousin Gertrude, in each case looking Byronic. Today, Esmond looked more somber than ever. I wasn't surprised. It was plain that he, too, had noted Gussie's spotty work apropos cocky and was feeling it deeply. He greeted me with a moody twitch of the cheek muscles, as if he had thought of smiling and then thought again and said, Oh, to hell with it. Hello, there. Hello, Esmond. Nice day. Yes. Out for a walk? Yes. You out for a walk? Yes. I'm out for a walk. <laughs> I just ran into Miss Purbright. Oh? Miss Purbright, eh? Yes. Uh, was... Was Worcester with her? Was... Oh, I, I, I see what you mean. No, she was alone. You sure? Certainly. He may have been lurking in the background, behind a tree or something. The meeting occurred in the station yard. He wasn't skulking in the doorway. Oh, no. Strange. Don't often see her without Worcester these days. No. No. Tell me about the fellow, Gussie. Is he a friend of yours? Oh, yes. Known him long? We were at school together. Hmm, I suppose he was a pretty loathsome boy, the parrier of the establishment. Oh, no. Well, changed after he grew up, eh? Well, he certainly made up leeway, all right. Because of all the stinking snakes, it has ever been my misfortune to encounter. He is the slimiest, the fish-faced trailing arbutus. He's not a bad chap. That may be your opinion, Gussie, but it is not mine. Nor, I should imagine, that of most decent people. Hell is full of men like Worcester. What the devil does she see in him? I don't know. Nor anyone else. Now, I have studied the fellow carefully and without bias. He seems to me to be entirely lacking in charm. Have you ever turned over a flat stone? From time to time. And what came crawling out? A lot of obscene creatures that might have been his brothers. I tell you, Gussie, if you were to put a bit of gorgonzola on the slide of a microscope and tell me to take a look, the first thing I'd say on getting it focused would be, why, hello, Worcester. Oh, I know the specious argument you are going to put forward. You are going to say it's not Worcester's fault that he looks like a slightly enlarged cheese mite. Very true. One strives to be fair, but it's not only the man's revolting appearance that distresses the better element. He is a menace to the community. Oh, come. What do you mean, oh, come? You heard what my Aunt Daphne was telling us the other night? 
about this ghastly Worcester's perpetually stealing policemen's helmets? Well, not perpetually, just a treat on boat race night. I don't like the way you stick up for the fellow, Gussie. You probably consider you're being broad-minded, but you want to be very careful how you let that so-called broad-mindedness grow on you. It's apt to become mere moral myopia. The facts are well documented. Whenever Worcester has a spare moment, he goes about London persecuting unfortunate policemen, assaulting them, hampering them in their duties, making their lives a hell on earth. Well, I'll tell you one thing, Gussie. I only hope he intends to start something on those lines here because we're ready for him. Eh? Ready and waiting. You know Dobbs? The flatty? Ah, oh, village constable, yes. A splendid fellow, tireless in the performance of his duties. I've not met him. I hear his engagement to Queenie, the parlourmaid, is broken off. So much the better, for it will remove the last trace of pity and weakness from his heart. I've told Dobbs all about Worcester and warned him to be on the alert. Let Worcester so much as lift a finger in the direction of Dobbs's helmet and he's for it. You might not think so at a casual glance, Gussie, but I am a justice of the peace. I sit on the bench at our local sessions and put it across the criminal classes when they start getting above themselves. If Worcester comes up before me, I shall give him 30 days without the option, regardless of his age or sex. You wouldn't do it, that is. I would, and I am looking forward to it. Let Worcester stray one inch from the straight and narrow path, just one inch, and you can kiss him farewell for 30 days. Well, I'll be moving along, Gussie. I find it helps a little to keep walking. Goodbye. Uh, uh, cheerio, Esmond. Oh, my golly. Oh, gosh. If only Jeeves were here. <coughs> Good morning, sir. Jeeves, you just manifested yourself out of the void. Oh, no, sir. I'm returning from the village where I have been running some errands for my Uncle Charlie. May I uh, make a remark, sir? Certainly, Jeeves. Carry on. Make several. It is with reference to your appearance, and, sir, if I might take the liberty of suggesting... Go on, say it. I look like something the cat found in Tutankhamen's tomb, don't I? I would not go so far as to say that, sir, but I have unquestionably seen you more soigné. As in way down upon the Soigné River, you mean? Uh, uh, sir? Oh, it doesn't matter, Jeeves. Very good. You appear somewhat uh, distrait, sir, if I may say so. I am distrait, Jeeves. About as distrait as I can stick. And it's enough to make me distrait. Not only have I got to stand up on a stage tonight and tell an audience, probably well provided with vegetables, that Christopher Robin goes hoppity hoppity hop. Uh, yes, sir. The village concert. Quite. But it's not just that, Jeeves. What is really making me distrait at this moment is that that man is up to it again. Sir? Sorry to speak in riddles. What I mean is that Gussie has once more become a menace of the first water. Indeed, sir. In what way? I will tell you. What started all this ranny gazoo? The circumstances of Mr. Fink Nottle being sent to prison, sir. Exactly. Well, it's an odds-on bet that he's going to be sent to prison again. Indeed, sir. I wish you wouldn't keep saying indeed, sir. Yes, the shadow of the pen is once more closing in on Augustus Pignottle. One false step and into the coop he goes for 30 days, and we know what will happen then, don't we? We do indeed, sir. Of course, it may be, Jeeves, that I am mistaken in supposing that this old lag is about to resume his life of crime, but I don't think so. Here are the facts. Just now, I encountered Miss Purbright in the station yard, and during our conversation, she happened to mention there was a little job she was getting Gussie to do for her, and her manner was evasive, or shall I say furtive. Whichever you prefer, sir. Well, it was a manner of a girl guiltily conscious of being in the process of starting something. And the thought that smote me like a blow was that if that is so, it's a hundred to eight, it's something in the nature of reprisals against Constable Dobbs. What ho, I said to myself. Hello, 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 hello. If I might interrupt for a moment, sir. I'm happy to inform you that my efforts to secure a clerk for Mr. Esmond Haddock at the concert this evening have been crowned with gratifying success. The back of the hall will be thronged with his supporters and well-wishers. I fail to understand you, Jeeves. Yes. If you recall our conversation of last Saturday morning, sir, you requested me to assemble a clerk for Mr. Haddock in the hope that, emboldened by a warm reception for his song this evening, he would defy the Mrs. Deverell, his aunts, thus effecting a reconciliation 
betwixt the young gentleman and Miss Purbright. Well, yes, geez, I remember all that, and the fact that you've got a clerk... Clerk, uh, sir? Yes, the fact you've got a clerk set up is excellent news. But what I'm dashed if I can see is what it's got to do with the res under discussion. I am extremely sorry, sir. It was your observing hello, 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 hello <coughs> that put the matter into my mind. Oh, because of Esmond's song, you mean? Exactly, sir. Hello, 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 hello. Precisely, sir. But you were saying, sir... Ah, yes. Corky's psychology is an open book to me, Jeeves. Even in the distant days when she wore rumpers and had a tooth missing in front, hers was always a fiery and impulsive nature, quick to resent anything in the shape of oompus boompus. And it is inevitably as oompus boompus that she would have classed the zealous officer's recent arrest of her dog. The unfortunate hound is languishing in a dungeon with jives upon his wrists, and a girl of her spirit is not likely to accept such state of things supinely. No, sir. You're right, no, sir. Corky is planning direct action against Constable Dobbs, taking we cannot say what form, and it seems only too sickeningly certain that Gussie, whom it is so imperative to keep from getting embroiled again with the force, is going to lend himself as an instrument to her sinister designs. And here's something that'll make you say, indeed, sir. I've just been talking to Esmond Haddock, and he turns out to be a J.P. Indeed, sir. Yes, Jeeves. He has the powers of the high, the middle, and the low justice in King's Deverell, and is consequently in a position to give anyone 30 days without the option as soon as look at them. And once more, he has taken a violent dislike to Gussie, and told me in so many words that it is his dearest wish to see the Darby's clapped on him. Try that one on your pianola. But surely, sir, Mr. Fink Nottles is essentially a law-abiding nature, not at all given to outbursts of social irresponsibility such as you envisage. Oh, I agree, Jeeves. Left to himself, Gussie is the last person likely to commit a tort or malfeasance. But one must remember that the poor fatted is easily swayed. You think that Mr. Fink Nottle will lend a willing ear to the young lady's suggestion? Her word is law to him. He will be wax in her hands. I tell you, Jeeves, the spirits are low. I don't know if you've ever been tied hand and foot to a chair in front of a barrel of gunpowder with an inch of lighted candle on top of it. No, sir, I have not had that experience. Well, that's just how I'm feeling. I'm just clenching the teeth and waiting for the bang. For I know Gussie may have done the deed already. It is more than likely, sir. What, what do you mean? If you would be so good as to direct your gaze up the road, sir, you would observe Mr. Finknottle being ejected from the village police station by Police Constable Dobbs. What? Oh, my golly! But, but... Yes, sir. What the devil has he been doing? I could not say, sir, but I would hazard the guess that the young gentleman has provoked the officer in some way, as the latter undoubtedly has the look of a man who has recently passed through some testing emotional experience. Gussie! Hey! Oh! Oh! Hello, Gussie! Hello! Uh, hello, Jeeves! Good morning, sir. Gussie, what is all this? Oh! That was Constable Dobbs. So I deduced. From the uniform, no doubt. That and the helmet. Quite, I see. Quite, I see. Quite, I see. Gussie, snap out of it. What? Oh, yes. C quite, I see. Quite, I see. Gussie, what the blazes have you been up to? Bertie, you have frequently been in the hands of the police, haven't you? Oh, frequently? Once. It is a ghastly experience, is it not? Your whole life seems to rise before you. By Jove, I could do with a drink of orange juice. Orange juice? Yes. Gussie, for the last time, will you kindly explain what's been going on in that valley police station? What were you doing? Who, me? Yes, you. Oh, I was strewing frogs. Jeez, I think something's gone wrong with my hearing. For a moment then, I thought Mr. Finknottle said he'd been strewing frogs. Y yes, uh, that was what Mr. Finknottle did say. Yes, Bertie, strewing frogs in Constable Dobbs's boudoir. The vicar suggested it. Jeez. Did Gussie say the vicar suggested it? Yes, sir. Oh, my aunt. No, Bertie, what I mean is, he gave Corky the idea. She'd been brooding a lot, poor girl, on Dobbs's high-handed behaviour in connection with her dog. And last night, the vicar happened to speak of Pharaoh and all those plagues he got when he wouldn't let the children of Israel go. You probably recall the incident. Well, it occurred to Corky that if Dobbs were visited by a plague of frogs, he might let Sam Goldwyn go. So she asked me to look in at his cottage and attend to the matter. Of course, a plate of lice would have been even more effective, but lice are hard to come by, whereas you can find frogs in any hedgerow. And what happened? Dobbs caught you? Fortunately, no. He came in about half a minute too late. I had bided my time, and having ascertained that the cottage was empty, I went in and distributed my frogs. And he appeared from somewhere around the corner? Exactly. It was a most embarrassing moment. 
One didn't quite know how to begin the conversation. Eventually I said, Oh, hello, there you are. And he stared at the frogs for some time, and then he said, What's all this? They were hopping about a bit. You know how frogs hop. Hither and thither, you mean? That's right, hither and thither. Well, I kept my presence of mind. I said, What's all what, officer? And he said, All these frogs. And I said, Ah, yes, there do seem to be quite a few frogs in here. You are fond of them? He then asked if these frogs were my doing. And I said, In what sense do you use the word doing, officer? And he said, Did you bring these frogs in here? Well, then, I'm afraid I willfully misled him, for I said no. It went against the grain to tell a deliberate falsehood, of course. But I do think there are times when one is justified. Get it... off! Uh, you bustle me so, Bertie. Where was I? Oh, yes. I said, no, I couldn't account for their presence in any way. I said it was just one of those things we should never be able to understand. Probably, I said, we were not meant to understand. And, of course, he could prove nothing. I think he must have appreciated this, for all he did was mutter something about it being a very serious offence to bring frogs into a police station. And I said, I suppose it was. And what a pity one could never hope to catch the fellow who'd done it. And then he asked me what I was doing there. And I said I had come to ask him to release Sam Goldwyn. And he said he wouldn't because he'd now established that the bite Sam had given him was his second bite. The first, of course, having been at Silversmith the butler, your uncle, Jeeves. Precisely. Uh, so then I said, oh, well then, I think I'll be going. And I went. He came with me, as you saw, growling under his breath. I can't say I like the man. His manner's bad, brusque, abrupt. Not at all the sort of chap likely to win friends and influence people. Now, mm, I suppose I had better be getting along and reporting to Corky. That stuff about the second bite will worry her, I'm afraid. Well, cheerio, Bertie. Cheerio, Jeeves. Good morning, sir. Jeeves? Sir? How is it that a super goof like Gussie has managed to go through life all this while without fetching up in some loony bin? I could not say, sir. You would have thought that some such establishment as Coney Hatch, with its talent scouts out all over the place, would have snapped him up years ago, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> would you wish me to speak a word to Mr. Fink Nottle, sir, warning him of the inadvisability of doing anything further of a rash nature? I say, yes, that's an idea. There's nothing I'd like better, Jeeves. He might listen to you. You're very good, sir. Then I shall proceed to the vicarage as soon as I have delivered these small purchases to my Uncle Charlie. Right ho. Oh, and Jeeves, one other thing, most important. When at the vicarage, get in touch with young Thost and remove from his possession a cosh or rubber bludgeon which he has managed to acquire. He speaks freely of beaning Constable Dobbs with it. So choke it out of him, will you? I shan't be easy in my mind till I know you've got it. Certainly, sir. I will give the matter my attention. Thank you, Jeeves. It's a black business, isn't it? Extremely, sir. I don't know when I've come across a blacker. Very, very murky everything is. With perhaps the exception of the affairs of Mr. Purblight, sir. Ah, yes, cat's meat. I was informed of his lucky strike. His hat's on the side of his head, they tell me. It was distinctly in that position when I last saw him, sir. He was playing gin rummy in the servants' hall with Queenie the parlourmaid in an attempt to raise the poor girl's spirits and was positively jocular. I fear, sir, that Mr. Purbright does not make an entirely convincing gentleman's personal gentleman. Well, as long as he answers to the name of Meadows and doesn't give the game away, let him be as rollicking as he likes, say I. He at least has speared the happy ending, and that's one ray of light we can chalk up. Yes, sir. And you say the village toughs are going to rally round Mr. Haddock this evening? In impressive numbers, sir. Well, dash it, that's two rays of light. And if you can talk Gussie out of making an ass of himself again, that'll be three. We're getting on, Jeeves. We mustn't lose heart. Exceedingly true, sir. No, Jeeves, we mustn't lose heart. And on that optimistic note, we parted. He to proceed directly to the servants' quarters of the hall, I to sneak through the grounds so as to avoid prowling aunts. From time to time, as I slunk from bush to bush, I could hear them baying in the distance. But I wasn't spotted and it was with something approaching a tra on my lips that I passed through the front door into the hall, only to find Bing, right in the middle of the fairway, arranging flowers at a table, Cat's Meat's future mother-in-law and the Bassett's godmother, Dame Daphne Winkworth, no less. Well, I suppose Napoleon or Attila the Hun or one of those fellows would have just waved a hand and said, Aha there, and hurried on, but the feat was beyond me. Even at the best of times, this female 20-minute egg put the wind up me pretty vertically, and she was now looking about 10 degrees more forbidding than usual. 
Her eye, swiveling round, stopped me like a bullet, and it was as much as I could do to stand on one leg and dash a bead of purse from the brow. The wedding guest, if you remember, had the same trouble with the ancient mariner. Ah, there you are, Augustus. Yes. I had no time to ask you last night. Have you written to Madeline? Uh, 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 yes, rather. Uh, I hope you were properly apologetic for having taken so long about it. Uh, 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 rather, yes. And why are you looking as if you had slept in your clothes? Well, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I did. Oh. Uh, I ran up to Wimbledon last night on the milk train. To see Madeline, don't you know? Oh, my dear boy. Oh, no. <laughs> you know how it is. I mean, you can't say all you want to in letters. Now, I thought, uh, well, well, the um, uh, personal touch, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Oh, oh Augustus. Uh, I, I think it was a good move. It was indeed. It is just the sort of thing that would appeal to Madeline's romantic nature. Why... <laughs> You are quite a Romeo, Augustus. <laughs> In the milk train. Huh? You must have been traveling all night. <laughs> Pretty well. Oh, you poor boy. I can see you're worn out. I will ring for Silversmith to bring you some orange juice. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Dear me, where is he? Ah, there you are, Silversmith. Yes, my lady. I must apologize for my delay in answering the bell, my lady. Oh, uh, when your ladyship rang, I was in the act of making a speech, and it was not until some moments had elapsed that I became aware of the summons. Making a speech? In honor of a happy event, my lady. My daughter Queenie has become a fiance. Indeed? Is, is Queenie your daughter? Yes, sir. Golly. And who is the happy man, Silversmith? A nice, steady young fellow, my lady. A young fellow called Meadows. A Meadow? Meadows? Yes, sir. From the village? No, my lady. Meadows is Mr. Fink Nottle's personal attendant. Well, uh, <laughs> yes, quite. I say. Uh, oh, uh, yes, sir, Silversmith. Mr. Fink Nottle would like a glass of orange juice. Very good, my lady. You will no doubt be wanting to change your clothes, Augustus. Silversmith will bring the orange juice to you in your room. Oh, uh, thanks. He might uh, tell Cat's uh, Meadows to bring it. Why, of course. You will want to wish him happiness. Uh, that's right. <laughs> yes, that, that, that's right. Uh, uh, wish him happiness. Oh, yes, quite. Hello, Bertie. Cat's me. I say, Bertie, old man. A rather unfortunate thing has happened. I know. This morning you finalised your plans for marrying the daughter of the house, and now you're engaged to the parlourmaid. What went wrong? I'll tell you. Do you want this orange juice? No. Then I'll have it. It may help a little. Oh! 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 When you're ready, cat's meat. Oh, yes. It all comes of letting that Dickens spirit creep over you, Bertie. The advice I give to every young man starting life is never get Dickensy. You remember I told you that for some days I've been bursting with a sort of yeasty benevolence. This morning it came to a head. I'd had Gertrude's note saying she would elope with me, and I was just a solid chunk of sweetness and light. And with these sentiments fizzing about inside me, with a milk of human kindness sloshing up against my back teeth, I wandered into the servants' hall and found Queenie still mourning her broken engagement to Dobbs. You decided to cheer her up? Exactly. I suggested a game of gin rummy, and we played for a while, but the poor girl's mind was clearly elsewhere. Suddenly she burst into tears. My heart bled profusely, Bertie. I said, there, there. I took her hand and patted it, but still she didn't stop. And then as I didn't seem to be making any headway. Almost unconsciously, I drew her onto my knee and put my arm around her waist and started kissing her, like a brother. Hmm. Don't say, hmm, Bertie. It was only what Sir Galahad or someone like that would have done in my place. Pretty square behaviour, I should have thought. Nevertheless, 
I wish I hadn't yielded to the kindly impulse. I regret it sincerely, because at that moment, Silversmith came in, and what do you think? He's her father. I know. You seem to know everything. I do. Well, there's one thing you don't know, and that is that he was accompanied by Gertrude. Gosh, yes. Manner on beholding, he was a bit reserved. Silversmith, on the other hand, wasn't. He looked like a minor prophet without a beard, suddenly confronted with the sins of the people, and started in immediately to thunder denunciations. There are fathers who know how to set about an erring daughter, and fathers who do not. Silversmith is one of the former. And then, in a sort of dream, I heard Queenie telling him we were engaged. She has since informed me that it's either her the only way out. It did, of course, momentarily ease the strain. But how did Gertrude appear to take it? Not very blithely. I just had a note from her cancelling our arrangements. Oh, Bertie, you see before you a spent egg. A man in whom all hope is dead. You don't happen to have any cyanide about you. Not a drop. I was afraid you wouldn't. Oh. And on top of all this, I've got to put on a green beard and play Mike in a pattern Mike knockabout crosstalk act at this blasted village concert. Oh, Lord, yes. A blasted village concert. <laughs> The village hall stood in the middle of the high street, just abaft the duck pond. Erected in the year 1881 by Sir Quinton Deverell Bart, a man who didn't know much about architecture but knew what he liked, it was one of those mid-Victorian jobs in glazed red brick which always seem to bob up in these old world hamlets and do so much to encourage the drift to the towns. When I entered it that evening, a few minutes after the concert had begun, and elbowed my way carefully through a dense wedge of tough eggs towards where Jeeves was standing, a large blonde, resembling a criterion barmaid of the old school, was on stage singing My Hero from the top of the my own, he's like on earth, who shall discover. Evening, Jeeves. Oh, good evening, sir. An excellent house. It will appear that you will be playing to capacity. Quite, but I'd really rather not think about it, if you don't mind. Have you examined the places of these standees? No, sir, I have not. Well, I have, Jeeves. I came in, hoping to detect some traces of roof and pity at what is known as kind indulgence, don't you know? Not a glimmer. No, sir. No, Jeeves. These are stern, implacable men, utterly incapable of taking the broad, charitable view and realizing that a fellow who comes on a platform and starts reciting about Christopher Robin saying his prayers doesn't do so from sheer wantonness, but because he is a helpless victim of circumstances beyond his control. Sorry to hear that, sir. Nevertheless, if I may express my own opinion, the gentlemen are behaving with considerable restraint <laughs> at this present moment. True, Jeeves, true. I've always ranked my hero next after the yeoman's wedding song as a standy rouser. Perhaps these splendid fellows don't war on women. Gentlemen, fear not, sir. I say, who is this blighted songbird? You've got a fellow fair there, I see. Uh, Miss Muriel, Kegley Bassington, sir. Oh, yes, Porky was moaning about the Kegley Bassington clan the other day. The program's stiff with them, I understand. The family is well represented. Certainly, sir. How many exactly? Well, sir, apart from Miss Muriel and the Kegley Bassington solo, we can look forward to Duologue, a pair of lunatics, Colonel and Mrs. R. P. Kegley Bassington, imitations, Watkin the Kegley Bassington, card tricks, Percival Kegley Bassington, rhythmic dance, Miss Poppy Kegley Bassington, and recitation from Master George. I see. Well, Master George, I absolve from blame, but I strongly suspect that he, like me, has been thrust into this painful position by force majeure and will be equally willing to make a cash settlement. But the rest is hard work. What a group! This, I would imagine, will be Master George Kegley Bassington now, sir. Oh, you're right, Jeeves. A reluctant performer, is that I saw one? Uh, yes, sir. The young gentleman certainly appears to have been propelled onto the stage by physical force. Vain battle! 
Aha! Note the belligerent pause, Jeeves, to see if anybody wants to make anything of it. Or has he forgotten the next line? And that was a soldier bold. All right, Dad, I know! Ben Battle was a soldier bold and used to wars along. A cannonball took off his leg so he laid out his arms. Uh, uh, now as they bore him, uh, off the field, he said, no, said he, uh, oh yes, let others shoot, for here I leave my second leg and the 32nd, uh, 42nd foot. Well, the army surgeons made how you live. about Send that? Me, uh, Barely adequate head. performance. Oh, Absolutely. It would be difficult, nay, impossible to imagine now, anything lousier. Love, and yet, Jeeves, uh, this is what's so encouraging. It's producing great. nothing whatever in the nature of a demonstration from our neighbours. Could it be, do you think, that these rugged exteriors hide hearts of girls? It is not impossible, sir. It certainly isn't. They don't war on women. They don't war on children. Might it not easily happen that they won't war on Worcesters either? Oh, we can but hope, sir. Absolutely. I am definitely encouraged, Chief. What's next on the menu? Uh, a violin solo by Miss Eustacia Polbrook, sir, followed by impressions of woodland songsters which are familiar to you all from Mr. Adrian Higgins, King's Devil's Grave, sir. Then the Hibernian entertainment featuring Mr. Purbright and Mr. Pink Nottle. Oh, the pattern might cross talk act, yes. And then? Mr. Haddock's songs. Good, excellent. Ah, oh, that'd be splendid. Can't wait for that. Hello? Hello? I think Master George has dried up completely. Yes, he's shambling off. Well, perhaps the worst of the kegley Bassington offensive is behind us now, Jeeves. What's next, did you say? Miss Eustacia Pulbrook, sir. A violin solo. Right, help. Clench the teeth, then, Jeeves. Clench the teeth. <laughs> Except for knowing that when you've heard one, you've heard them all, I'm not really an authority on violin solos. So I cannot state definitely whether La Poolbrooks was or was not a credit to the accomplices who had taught her the use of the instrument. It was loud in spots, and less loud in other spots, and it had that quality which I have noticed in all violin solos, of seeming to last much longer than it actually did. However, it blew over eventually, and the stage was left to Adrian Higgins. And uh, while his impressions of woodland songsters didn't go with any particular bang, the drawing of a cork and pouring out of a bottle of beer which took him off made a solid hit, leaving the customers in excellent mood. So all in all, Gussie and Catsmeat couldn't have had a better spot. And when they came on, festooned in green beards, they got a big hand. It was the last time they did. The act died standing up. Right from the start, I saw that it was going to be a turkey, and so it proved. It was listless. It lacked fire and oomph. Their very opening words struck a chill. Hello, Pat. Hello, Mike. How's your father? He's not enjoying himself just now, Bigora. Oh, what's he doing? Seven years. <laughs> Faith and Begob. And how's your brother... Jum. He's just got a job as a swimming teacher. Is he happy? No, Begara. He's often in low water. Uh, faith and Begob? And who was that lady I saw you coming d down the street with? Who was that lady you saw me coming down the street with? Yes, Begara. Uh, who was that lady I saw you coming down the street with? Faith and Begob. That was no lady. That was my wife. <laughs> Why do bees hum? I don't know. Why do bees hum? Because they can't remember the words. Jeez. Uh, you know that grey, hopeless feeling you sometimes get listening to the rain at three o'clock on a Sunday afternoon in November? Yes. Sir. I've got it now. Yes. What's wrong with the blighters? Yeah, I would imagine that Mr. Purbright's despondency might be attributed to the fact that Miss Winkworth, sitting in the front row, must be clearly visible to him. 
true, Jeeves. But what's Gussie got in his mind? I could not say, sir. Oh, golly. I think Gussie's fallen into a trance. My sister's in the valley. I said my sister's in the valley. Oh, God. You say her sister's in the valley. Yes, Begar, my sister's in the valley. What does your sister do in the valley? She comes rushing in and then she goes rushing out. What does she have to rush like that for? Faith and Begar because of the Russian ballet. Oh, come on, Gussie. They're going, Jeeves. On a moment too soon, in my view. No, sir. They look like a couple of pallbearers who've forgotten the coffin. Now what? Mr. Haddock, sir. <laughs> Like it. I'm proud of it. Your flat's working beautifully. Right, O.S., oh, yes, we've done our bit. Now it's up to you to deliver the goods. The sun is high up in the sky. The moon is bright and fair. The eager hounds are in full cry. The barking rends the air. Hello, 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 hello. A hunting we will go, my lads. A hunting we will go. Pull up your socks and case the fox and lay the blight alone. Oh, hearken to the merry horn, over break and over thorn, we'll ride over while bags get torn. What ho, what ho, what ho. A showstopper by Joe. Extremely gratifying, sir. My golly, after a triumph like this, can he never stand in fear of those belly arms of his again? Christopher Robin poems, I shall... Jeeves. Is something the matter, sir? You bet something's the matter, Jeeves. I've forgotten every word. Sir? But those infernal poems. I don't know, my disturbed night, my taxing day and whatnot. I've forgotten every blasted word. Indeed, sir. Jeeves. Yeah, I beg your pardon, sir. I should have said, really, sir. Really, sir, it's just as bad. This calls for a gore blimey at the very least. Jeeves. I've forgotten every damn word. I shall stand up there in front of that Union Jack, opening and shutting my mouth like a goldfish. Jeeves, a solution, please, and make it snappy. You cannot jog your memory, sir? No, I can't. In that case, I think you would be well advised to refrain from attempting to entertain the audience, sir. Right, but how can I? I would suggest, sir, that you hand the whole conduct of the affair over to Mr. Haddock. Eh? I am confident that Mr. Haddock would gladly deputize for you, sir. It is only necessary to look at the young gentleman at this moment, sir, to observe that he is in an uplifted frame of mind. I have no doubt that he would welcome the opportunity to appear again before his public after the intermission. But he couldn't learn the stuff in time. No, sir, but he could read it from a book. You think so? Undoubtedly, sir. Tonight, Mr. Haddock is the idol of King's Devil. You mean he can get away with anything? Exactly. Yes, I think you're right. As always, you have found the way. Right, her then, Jeeves. Oh, but I say, I haven't got the book with me. I have a copy on my person, sir. I have been intending to station myself at the side of the stage in order to prompt you, as I believe the technical expression is, uh, should you have had need of my services. That's dash good of you, Jeeves. Very white, very futile. Not at all, sir. I will step round to the stage door at once in order to explain the position of affairs to Mr. Haddock the moment he leaves the stage. Right, oh, Jeeves. And I shall come up with you. I intend to spend the rest of the evening in the goose and cowslip across the road. Very good. Thank you, Jeeves. Hello, 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 hello. A hunting we will go, my lads. A hunting we will go.
Bertie, Bertie! Gussie, is that you? Yes. I say, Bertie, are you going into the pub? Yes. Do you think you could get me some brandy? You mean orange juice? No, I do not mean orange juice. I mean brandy. I don't like to go in myself with this green beard on. Well, why did you take it off? I can't get it off. I stuck it on with spirit gum, and it hurts like sin when I pull at it. Now, Bertie, please, some brandy, quick. About a bucket full. I have to nerve myself for a frightful ordeal. Gussie, Gussie, you're forgetting. Your ordeal is over. You've done your act. And pretty lousy it was, too, if I may say so. What was the matter with you? Wasn't I good? No, you were not good. You were cheesy. Your work lacked fire and snap. Well, so would your work lack fire and snap. If you had to play in a knockabout crosstalk act and know that directly the thing was over, you were going to break into a police station and steal a dog. What? Say that again. What's the point of saying it again? You heard. I promised Corky I'll go to Dobbs's cottage and extract that dog of hers. She will be waiting in the car near at hand and will gather the animal in and whisk it off to the house of some friends of hers who live a few miles along the London Road, well out of Dobbs's sphere of influence. So now you know why I want brandy. Oh, my God. I want brandy, too. In that episode, the parts were played as follows. Jeeves, Michael Horden, Bertie Richard Bryars, Esmond Haddock, James Villers, Corky Purbright, Joe Candle, Catsmeet Purbright, Kenneth Fortescue, Gussie Fink Dottle, David Valor, Dame Daphne Winkworth, William Margulies, Cousin Thomas, Muriel Kegley Bassington, and Master George Kegley Bassington, Denise Breyer, Silversmith, John Dunbar. The piano at the village concert was played by John Gould, who also wrote the song A Hunting We Will Go. The episode was adapted for radio by Chris Miller from the book The Mating Season by P.G. Woodhouse. Uh-huh.